<clears throat> Many years ago, I read a verse in the Living Bible, Proverbs 14 and verse 14, which says the godly man's life is exciting. So I realize that if my life is not exciting, if I'm bored with my Christian life, I am not a godly man. And <clears throat> if you're honest, most Christians that I've met would not say that their life is exciting. Their Christian life, I mean. They may be making money in the world and think that's exciting, but that's only temporary. But the mark of a truly godly man is that his Christian life is exciting. And I want to testify that has become true in my life for a number of years. And there are certain reasons. <clears throat> and I'll tell you some of them. First of all, I want to read a verse in Matthew 4 and verse 4. And if you take me seriously, it can be true in your life too. There's no partiality with God. He treats every human being just the same. But there are laws. And it's just like, you know, you read so much in the inter internet about eating the right type of food if you want to live healthy and you want to live long. And many people take that seriously. Don't eat all this too much stuff which is full of oil and all that. You can, many other things like that, too many sweets. And many people take that seriously because they do want to be healthy and they do want to live long. So if we take God's laws in the same way spiritually, we'll experience that exciting Christian life. Matthew 4, verse 4. First of all, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And to me, the most important word in that sentence is the word every. Man shall not live by food alone. He's not saying food is not necessary. Food is necessary. But there's something more important than that. Not the word of God, but every word that proceeds from God's mouth. Now, I've studied this book, the Bible, for 64 years. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. From the time I was born again at the age of 19, I began to study the Bible seriously. And <clears throat> I took the Bible as God's word in the beginning because people told me it was God's word. I had no proof for it. And then over a period of time in my early days, there were a few people I met now and then who seemed to have a radiance about their Christian life. Maybe one in a thousand believers. <laughs> There'd be something radiant about their Christian life. And when I got to talk to them, I found two things true of them. Not only them, but in my entire lifetime, I may have found a few radiant Christians. But there's two things I found true of all of them. One was they believed the Bible to be the word of God from cover to cover. Every one of them. And the second was they all had an experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I realized that <clears throat> these are the two things I must have. One, believe the Bible is God's word and the other, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So today, if people ask me, <clears throat> why do I believe the Bible to be God's word? Those days, I would say, because I've, the most godly people I've met believe it. But today, I say it's changed my life. Its promises have been fulfilled. And... But the important word I hear is says, every. Now, if a person has been a Christian, for more than four years, and he's not read the entire Bible, not understood, understanding takes a long time, but not read through the whole Bible from cover to cover, I would say he has no respect for God. And if any of you are like that, I have to tell you straight to your face, you don't have any respect for the God you claim to believe in. If you've been a believer, say, four years, and you have not read the Bible from cover to cover, it doesn't take long. If you discipline yourself. 
And it means you have taken God lightly. See, what would you think of a bride whose bridegroom has gone away to a long, faraway place and says, I'm coming back and we'll get married as soon as he come back. And supposing he writes a long letter, you know, people are in love with each other can sometimes write long letters. Say a letter of 30 pages. Uh, Do you think she would read every word in it? Or would she just read here and there and leave it aside and pick it up now and then and read a little more? If it's like that, I would say (laughs) she doesn't really love love her fiancé. She wants to marry him, but maybe because he's a rich man and he can, she can get a lot of benefits by marrying him. But she doesn't really love him. And I would say a person who doesn't read God's word and hasn't read it in four years would say he doesn't really love God. No, he wants all the benefits he can get from God, like this bride wants to marry a rich man and live in a grand house and have a fine car and all those advantages. But doesn't really love him because when he took all the trouble to write that long letter, she just read a few pages here and there. Now apply that to your attitude towards God's word. I see this verse mean that if you really want to live the type of life God wants you to live, an exciting life, you have to take every word of God as his word. Believe it's all inspired. And then you will really live. Man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I hope you will never forget that sentence. That you will live spiritually that exciting life only if you take every single word of God seriously. Now, I remember the first time I read through the Bible, I took about six months, I think, six or seven months after I was born again to read the whole Bible. I didn't understand most of it, sure. Even now I can't say I understand every part of it, but it's understanding has developed, developed, and as I, my understanding has developed, my life has changed. But I can say this, that because I took that attitude towards God's word, to respect his word, it changed my attitude towards sin. When we respect the word of God, it will change our attitude towards sin. Let me read you another verse in 2 Timothy and chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3.16. Here again, the important word is that first word, all. All scripture is inspired by God. It's like saying, to use the illustration of the girl whose fiancé has written a long 30-page letter, every word in that letter was written by your fiancé. It wasn't Part of it wasn't written by somebody else. Are you interested in reading what the one you're going to get married to has written to you? Do you really love him? Or are you only interested in getting the benefits you can get by marrying him one day? For many Christians, their relationship with God is, what can I get from him? Can he make my life a little more comfortable? Can he answer my prayers? And if life gets a little difficult, then they have questions. What would you think of this girl who said he was very much in love with that man and then one day he lost his job or he lost his wealth and fortune and everything if she decides I don't want to marry him they were not really in love all scripture every single word of scripture is inspired by God and the margin of my Bible said it was breathed by God and it is profitable now if you knew of some business on earth that would really be profitable. A lot of people are making money on it, like people go to the stock market and they make a lot of money and people go into it. 
if you really believe that a certain avenue was, there's no risk of failure. I mean, the stock market is tremendous risk of failure. But if there was some avenue of business where there was absolutely no risk of failure, but tremendous possibility of making profit, I think a lot of people would jump for it. And here it says all scripture is profitable. I'm going to make profit from it. I can testify that. It's really changed my life. It's changed my family life. It's changed the way I brought up my children. And many other things in my life. It's given me health. God's word. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of, man of God or the woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In other words, God's word trains me to live the type of life I'm supposed to live on this earth, the way Adam and Eve did not live. So if we take God's word seriously like that, what do we do when we come across a verse that we can't understand? I get a picture of a farmer wanting to sow crop on his field and there are a lot of rocks and stones and he takes his plow and plows the field and supposing he comes across a rock there, does he just go around it? And if he goes, goes around every rock that he finds, his field will be full of rocks. But a serious farmer would say, well, I don't care how big this rock is, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to plow every part of this field. Now, a farmer has that much sense. But many Christians, most Christians I have met, they come across a difficult verse. They just go around it. And they leave it there. They read it another time, and five years later, they just go around it. Never try to dig that out and say, what does that mean? And why doesn't the farmer do that? He's just too lazy. And why don't Christians seek to understand it? Why don't they go to somebody who knows God's word better and say, brother, can you please explain this to me? I've met serious Christians who come to me like that. And I've taken sometimes a long time to explain verses to them. Or nowadays they can go to the internet and search and find answers to some of these things, but they're too lazy. Now, if it was some area of their place of work, supposing it was computer science or electrical engineering, some area where they were finding difficult now in their work and their progress in their profession was dependent on knowing that, oh boy, what a lot of time they would sit up all night on the internet trying to find out and reading books because they want to get through that. We have to face the fact that such people are more interested in their earthly life than their relationship with God, and God says, okay, you'll have everything you have on earth, but you'll have nothing with me. And that's the tragedy of most Christians, and there are very few pastors who challenge them in this area. Most Christians come to church just to listen to a message and go home. The pastor is there to do all the preaching and studying the word. And that's why their own lives are shallow. That's why they, they fight with their wives, get angry with their wives, and yell at their wives. They never seem to feel that there's any better life than that. I've seen believers who've been believers for 25 years, and they still get angry with their wives and husbands. What type of Christianity is that? I mean, if that was the Christianity offered me, I'd throw it in the garbage bin. I said, I don't want something like that. That leaves me defeated in my semen, even after 25 years of reading it and struggling and going to church. If I'm still defeated, there's something wrong with this. I'd rather say there's something wrong with me. I have not taken God's word seriously. We take it much more seriously when a doctor says, you must take this treatment, you must take this pill three times every day for one week. And you must come back for a checkup after one month. Boy, how rigidly we do that. And if the sickness is serious, we'd go again and again for one a whole year. Which proves one thing, we really care for our physical life. But if God says something like that, we take it lightly. Which proves whatever you may say, however much you may say you're going to church and you think you're very spiritual, I want to say to you in Jesus' name, you're not spiritually minded at all. You're fooling yourself. When you realize that man is spirit, soul, and body, and soul means our mind, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says man is three parts, spirit, mind, and body. And the difference between an animal and a human being, an animal's got a body. 
An animal's got a mind too. You know that a dog's got a mind. It's intelligent. But the one thing an animal does not have is spirit. Spirit is that part of us which can contact God. And that's supposed to be more important. Just like we know that our mind is more important than our body. Your spirit is more important than your mind. And if I don't give primary, if, I don't, if the order in my life is not spirit, mind, body, I change that to say, I think all of us would put our mind above our body because otherwise we wouldn't be working. We just sit around lazily at home. We do put our mind above our body, but it's a question of whether we put our spirit above our mind. And I thought one reason why God made animals and man on the same day. If you read Genesis chapter 1, he made different things on different days. But when it came to animals and human beings, he created the fish on the fifth day. Okay. But animals, the animals on earth are a little more like us in terms of body and legs and hands and all compared to fish. When he made animals, he made them on the same day, on the sixth day. It's not only man that was made on the sixth day. Animals were made on the sixth day, but the animals were made in the first part of the sixth day. And man was created on the second part of the sixth day. And the difference was this. When God made animals, he said, just a word. And lions and elephants and all types of animals just came into being with one word. But when it came to human beings, it wasn't, he didn't just say, let there be a man. No, it says, he took clay, the mud, and formed a body. Now, God doesn't have hands, but in some way he formed that body, maybe with a spoken word, but he formed a body first, which had no mind <laughs> and no spirit. It was worse than the animals he made, because the animals at least had a mind. This one, this creature was just a, a sculpture of clay. But then God did something which he never did for the animals. He breathed into that clay sculpture and suddenly that sculpture got spirit and mind and became, a, the Bible says, a living soul. The soul is mind. It became a living soul because a spirit came in there. Without a spirit, it would be just a soul. And God's desire was, this man was to live by his spirit, which is the most important part of him. If he only lived by his mind and body, animals live by their mind and body, and dogs and even snakes and all those, they use their mind and to find food and find some place where they can, even the birds, find some place where they can make a nest for their little ones and you know how protective a female dog can be about her little ones? All that is there, but they have no connection with God. That's why you find every animal, every animal that I've ever seen, its head is always down, whether it's a dog or a cow or anyone. They're always looking down at the things of the earth. It's only man that's created to look up. You ever seen a dog looking up all the time? It's not created that way. It doesn't have a spirit. God doesn't figure into that animal's thinking. It's only its earthly needs. And God made animals and man on the same day with this one difference, that man was created to live by spirit in contact with God and to teach him one thing. When you stop living by your spirit, you will descend to the level of the animals. That's why he made them both on the same day. The animals, the first part, man in the second part to teach him, the moment you stop living by your spirit, you will descend to the level of the animals and all that will be important to you will be your food, your health, your making money, and the 101 things on earth, your pleasure and sex and everything else that you enjoy, all of which God created, you can enjoy it all. But when spirit is not first, you've begun to descend to the level of the animals and you can sit in a church and sing songs and 
imagine that you're a wonderful Christian, but you don't have a spiritually exciting life. You can, you have, that's why you have to seek for excitement in, uh, in sex and movies and uh, money and what money can buy and travel and seeing places. And there's nothing wrong in all that, provided that's not your primary source of excitement. Because dogs also would find, animals also would find some excitement in a lot of things on this earth. Now, I want to tell you the truth. I mean, I've seen Christians in many, many countries. I've traveled to many, many countries and I've seen all types of Christians in all types of denominations. And I've found that this is a problem everywhere. Even among those who feel that their doctrine is superior to somebody else's. So when they don't take God's word seriously. So I want to just show you one verse. I want to ask you, how many of you read it? Is this a, is it a, is this a rock? that was in your field and which you plowed around, you didn't dig it up to find out. You just left it there. And every time you come to that verse, you go around it. 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. I mean, there are many tough verses in the Bible. I'm just taking one. 1 Peter 4 verse 1 says, Since Christ, therefore since Christ has suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, Bible is the New American Standard Bible, which, after comparing all the translations I've come across, is the most accurate in relation to the Greek from which the New Testament is translated and into the Hebrew from which the Old Testament is translated. That's why I use it. Now I've looked up this verse in some other translations, and the worst is the New International Version, NIV. I've told everybody's got an NIV to throw it away because they have completely changed this verse and given an interpretation to it, the translator's interpretation, which is not at all according to the Greek. In other words, when they translate it, you see, when you translate somebody's words, you have no right to change their words. I mean, in a court of law, if somebody's translating somebody else's document and they change it and put their own opinion there, they'd be uh, taken to court and challenged on that. But imagine translators translating God's word and changing just because they don't understand it and trying to give their own interpretation. It's a very serious error. So what does this mean? Why is this verse important? Because it says here, if you suffer in this flesh, if you understand what it means, you will stop sinning. Now, who is interested in this? Supposing there's a plague going around, COVID-19, for example, recently. And uh, if you take this vaccine, you won't get sick. Look at the long lines that of people waiting to get a COVID vaccine. I went there myself and I had to wait a long time for my turn to come. And then they offer a second dose and again you go, there's a long line. How eager people are not to get sick, not to leave this rotten old world. <laughs> They're so eager to live. What about here it says you will stop sinning? The promise here is not that you live long. <laughs> The promise not here is not that you will overcome sickness. There are long lines for people waiting to overcome sickness, getting a vaccine. But here the promise is, you'll stop sinning. You'll stop getting angry with your wife. You'll stop getting angry with your husband. You'll stop getting depressed. You'll stop getting anxious. You'll stop murmuring and complaining. Do you want that life? I'll tell you, most people don't want that life. They're quite happy with yelling at their wife and getting angry and discouraged and depressed and gloomy and uh, 101 other things. Hurting others, speaking rudely to others with no control over their speech. They're quite happy. I mean, they're like that 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, rude and um, insensitive to the feelings of others. They're quite happy, content. They have no desire to stop sinning. Well, I say this verse is not for them. No. 
For example, if, a, if there's a course offered, a free course offered to those who want to graduate in computer science or artificial intelligence, a lot of people would rush for it, but no dog is going to rush for that. He's not interested in that. And a person who's just lazy about, uh, doesn't want to earn any money, just wants to play the fool, won't go for that. Little children won't go for that. But a person who's serious about earning good, a good income would go for that, however trouble it, how, however difficult it may be. You travel long distances to attend the course every, every day. And the only person who will take this verse seriously is the one who says, I want to finish with sin in my life. And if you have not taken this verse seriously, my dear friend, I don't want to insult you, but I want to tell you the truth. You're not interested in finishing with sin in your life. You're quite content with a certain amount of sin. It's like saying, I don't want to be perfectly healthy. I'd like to have about 15, 20% of sicknesses in my body. I don't want to be perfectly healthy. It's terrible to be perfectly healthy. Imagine being perfectly healthy. Do you ever think like that about physical health? I've never seen a sensible human being thinking like that. But most Christians I met are happy with a certain amount of sin in their life. Well, this verse is not for such people. But I remember, I was not like that myself. Even after I accepted Christ, my life was an endless cycle, like a children's merry-go-round. You sin, and you say, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me in your blood. Next day again you sin. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse me in your blood. And the next year, it's the same thing. It's day after day after day. It's an endless circle. It's like children who sit in that, on those wooden horses and go on a merry-go-round. And 10 years later, they're in the same place, same place. No progress at all. Well, it was like that for my life for a long time. until I got fed up. And I found I had to take verses like this very seriously, to finish with conscious sin. And I discovered as I studied the scripture that the meaning of that was, the word flesh is used in two different ways. One is this physical flesh. In the Old Testament, it's always this. But in the New Testament, it speaks about this. But it also speaks about in Galatians 5, 17, of the Holy Spirit fighting against the flesh. And the, and the flesh, Galatians 5, 17, fighting against the Holy Spirit. So I say, I discover, when I read that, I say, the Holy Spirit is not fighting against my body. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why should he fight against his body? So obviously, flesh is another meaning in the New Testament. So, you know, just like a person who is doing a computer science course and there's something he doesn't understand, he's going to sit all night and work out and find out what is the meaning of that because he wants to make progress to make more money. I decided I want to find out what is the other meaning of the flesh in the New Testament because it's not to make more money but because I wanted to cease from sin. And I discovered, and I'll give you the benefit of my study, free. Flesh means your self-will. The strongest thing in you is not your muscles, it's your self-will. That's the reason for all the arguments, fightings, the Ukraine war and, the, and uh, your fights with your wife all come from strong self-will. I will not yield my will and the other party says, I will not yield my will. Oh, you're ready for a clash, whether it's Russia and Ukraine or whether it's a husband and a wife. Self-will. Christ suffered in his self-will means... Let me read it like that. Since Christ suffered in his self-will, arm yourself with the same purpose. Because if you suffer in your self-will, you will finish with sin. So I realize sin is to do my own will. And holiness is to do the will of God. I won't go beyond that today because it will take a few hours. But I'll read one verse and close. What was the secret of Jesus' life? John chapter 6, verse 38. There are many biographies of Jesus in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
But there's only one autobiography. You know what an autobiography is, where the person writes his own life story. Jesus spoke his own life story in that one verse. His entire 33 and a half years on earth is described in one verse. That's his autobiography, John 6, 38. I came from heaven. And Lord, what did you do on earth for 33 and a half years? I never did my own will. Or in other words, I never sinned. But I always did the will of him who sent me. Brothers and sisters, that is why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because our self-will is so strong. When it says the spirit fights against the flesh, what's he fighting against? Your self-will. And what is it in you that fights against the Holy Spirit? Your self-will. Many people are praying, oh God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll never be filled with the Holy Spirit because they don't want to give up their self-will. Why in the world should God fill them with the Holy Spirit? To indulge in their self-will? Oh no. He who has ears to hear, let him hear.